The item behind me is the RB211, it's the RB21122B. And in March of 1968, the company uh, won a competitive award to power the Lockheed TriStar. And it was supported by many airlines, we call them launch airlines, who uh, were happy with the choice of that engine to power that aeroplane. Uh, RB211 is, is a, a breed of jet engine and a jet engine in its simplest form has a compressor to suck in air, compress it, you then set fire to it by injecting some fuel which continuously burns. That raises the temperature of that compressed air which then expands through the turbine and the turbine has enough power to drive the compressor and some left over. If it's a pure jet for a fast jet fighter for example then the exhaust velocity will be very, very high. But alternatively, you can put it through a further turbine to drive a big fan, and the big fan increases the thrust, increases the propulsion efficiency, and correspondingly, for a given amount of thrust, reduces the, th the fuel burn, and so enabling a commercial airliner to go further. And from a, a, an efficiency point of view, every last 1% of efficiency at the time when I was doing RB211 design, 1% of efficiency was worth $100,000 per aeroplane per year. So even fractions of a percent of perfection or imperfection removed was of great importance. It's dominated by fuel efficiency. There were several challenges. <clears throat> On the technical side, really, there were two that stood out. One was how do you make the composites work when all your experience is on small subsonic aerodynamics? And the second one was how do you get to the very high turbine entry temperatures that you really need to give enough power in the turbine to drive not only the compressors that compress the core gas, but also to have enough energy to drive the fan at a, a good speed with a good pressure ratio to get that propulsive efficiency that you need. But the other challenge was that uh, the, uh, the uh, if you like, the, uh, the policy of the company was to develop engines through development rather than uh, design. And therefore, they had a committed to the launch airlines to have a sequence of standards which were anticipated to be the logical steps towards a final uh, service engine that would be in service for tens of years, probably best part of half a century, maybe even more than that. Uh, and that actually massively increased the volume of work. So not only was it technically challenged, but managerially. And we rose actually to a total number of people that related to the design process of 771 people, all expert in some way, but very few of them expert in the new features of the RB211 engine. At the time of the going into receivership, a very experienced Rolls-Royce turbine designer um, had subsequently run the car company in crew and seeing all these difficulties was brought back and we all met with him and explained how we were going to get the engine right and so on and he judged that what we were proposing to do was inadequate and that there would be a cost overrun and he went to his board colleagues and then to the government and said you know this is uh, not going to make it. Fortunately, um, Lockheed had the confidence and by bringing in some old hands, some very experienced people, notably Sir Stanley Hooker, uh, Freddie Morley, um, and they both knew me and I knew them and they actually helped convey to the bankers, to the airlines, uh, the confidence that we had and in fact, he was so confident, and of course we were supportive of that confidence, uh, we were so uh, supportive that we actually decided to launch a more powerful version of the engine within the same scantlings of the basic engine. 
it could have been a very stressful time. In fact, it wasn't for me personally, because you could see how you could structure your day to do the clever stuff in the morning, have the meetings, go through the balance of arguments on particular aspects of the design. But then later on in the day, you could walk around, talk to everybody who was working on the job, at least as far as those inside the company were concerned. But then at night, after a break with the family and having uh, supper with the children before they went to bed, we could come back and go into the workshops, into the factory, see parts being made, and understand at first hand what was causing the difficulty. And the following morning, you could come back and you could talk to the guys who got that part of the job to do and say, why don't you talk to so-and-so in number four shop or wherever in order that you can get a, a deeper insight into what's causing the difficulties there. Initially, we were not allowed to move parts between different parts of the factory. We had no money. Uh, how did we recover? But Freddie Morley, who was my mentor and who'd been responsible for developing much of my career, uh, Freddie Morley said, well, if you are so clever that you can solve this problem, show me you can solve it with the parts you've already got. And that was a very, very good lesson because, indeed, if you put the extra effort in, that's exactly what you can do. And a further point was that um, prior to going bankrupt, there was a measure of unease amongst the staff that really perhaps we weren't being paid well enough for what we were doing. Uh, but in fact, after bankruptcy, everybody just gave of their best. Well, the engine behind me is the Trent and it's one of several versions of the Trent, but it, the architecture of that engine is very much the architecture of the RB211. Uh, it, it's a matter of some pride, really, that the engine has gone on to be very successful, but perhaps one of the most successful aero engines, commercial engines, certainly, that Rolls-Royce has ever had. I well remember the first time I went to Hong Kong, looking out of one window and seeing 34 RB211-powered aircraft. That was a tremendous joy.